If you've bought a Mac recently, you'll know just how expensive it can be when selecting your storage. Apple charges about three or $400 per terabyte on storage, where your average internal SSD will be well under $100. On top of that, you can only select a storage option when you buy your machine. It's not upgradable like a PC, and that's where these little drives can be extremely beneficial. These are external solid state drives, and they run just as fast as the internal storage, if not faster on a lot of Macs, but there are a lot of options out there. There's things that you have to look out for, and finding the right drive and navigating through all the specs and compatibility Compatibility can be a real pain. Today, I wanna to help clear all that up. I'm gonna to touch on what some of the problems are with Mac storage, how these external drives can help, not only as an affordable way to expand storage, but a whole host of other things as well. So if you're curious to know what these drives can do for you and how they perform, maybe you're shopping for a new Mac and trying to save yourself some money, or you're just looking to add on to your storage, stick around and let's get into it. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. All new Macs these days, whether you have a desktop Mac or a MacBook, have one unfortunate detail. Their storage is not upgradable. Around 2016 or so, Apple started soldering their SSDs onto the logic board in their machines. And since then, what you buy is what you get for internal storage, which not only isn't ideal if you bought a Mac with not enough storage or you have a limited budget, but also if that internal drive fails on you, you obviously can't just swap it out. Now, between about 2016 to 2018, all hope wasn't lost. Even if your internal SSD failed, you could still plug in an external drive and boot into your OS. But with the introduction of the T2 chip, that whole boot system moved from living outside of the internal SSD to inside it. Meaning if your internal drive fails, your machine is pretty much toast. For most folks, it's not likely that your internal storage is going to fail on you. These do technically have a limited amount of reads and writes on them, but I personally never had any issues with my Macs. But still, the fact remains that these do show up for warranty returns and in repair shops with SSD problems, albeit rarely. But that is enough for a lot of people to wanna either try and limit that risk or protect their data, which is where these external drives come in. The case can be made that reading and writing to one of these external SSDs can help offload some of the work that you're doing and extend the longevity of your machine. But in the event that your internal drive does fail, you'll still have all the data that was living on the external one, which does lessen the blow of your Mac turning into a giant paperweight. I bought a bunch of different drives here. A few of them I've been using for quite some time and some are newly released as well. These all run off USB-C and have varying degrees of price and performance. I will link all of them in the description below, but let's just kick things off by going over some of the more inexpensive options and working our way into the premium ones. First on the list are these ready-made portable SSDs, which are gonna be the most affordable out of the bunch. And if all you're doing is transferring files, watching media, or doing things that don't require super high performance, these are gonna be more than enough for almost everyone. The tricky thing with these types of drives is there are a ton to choose from and some things that you really need to look out for. With anything that's half decent, you'll see most of them listed as USB 3.1 Gen 2 or USB 3.2 Gen 2, which effectively is the same thing. USB protocols are very strange and confusing and that's a topic for another video, but if you ignore that and just look out for the advertised speed being 10 gigabits per second or in the ballpark of 1000 megabytes per second, which should be stamped somewhere on the box or a product listing, that's generally a good starting point. Just remember that any advertised speed is gonna be theoretical or tested in perfect lab conditions. And in the real world, they're gonna come in at considerably lower than what the manufacturer lists. The two drives that I have here are very similar in speed and are probably the two most popular options, the SanDisk Extreme Pro and Samsung T7. And in actual tests on the Mac Studio, they come in at just under 700 megabytes per second read times and 800 megabytes per second write times, which like I said, is more than enough for most folks. Now, if this were a year ago, I'd have had no problems recommending either of these drives. In fact, I've done that in past videos, which is partly why I wanted to make this one. But recently, the version two SanDisk Extreme Pro drive has seen insanely high failure rates, especially on the four terabyte models. I'll pop up a list of models here affected by these same issues, but if you still have one of these older V1 Extreme drives, those should still be fine but I would definitely stay away from these drives or even think about replacing them if you've bought the V2 model 
or the ones listed here. In any case, because the speeds on these two are relatively the same, I generally stick with the Samsung T7 drive these days because they're just a lot more reliable at a similar price point. Another thing that you have to be careful of are models that advertise USB 3.2 Gen 2x2 that usually show up as double the speed of the drives that I just mentioned. Apple actually doesn't support Gen 2x2, so they're still gonna run at the same speed as the ones that we just went over, and some PCs might not support them either. So while these do still technically work at Gen 2 speeds, you will be wasting money with these drives. If you feel like you want more performance, the next real step up is Thunderbolt 3 or 4 or USB 4 drives, which run at about four times the speed of the drives that I just went over at 40 gigabits per second. And while you can get ready-made portable Thunderbolt or USB 4 SSDs, they're usually very expensive. And again, you'll want to be careful of the SanDisk Professional models because they can suffer from the same problems as the Extreme Pros do. Your best bet here, if you want to save some money and get those higher transfer speeds is by using a Thunderbolt or USB 4 enclosure and pairing that with an internal NVMe drive. Those will be a little bit more affordable and generally have better value, but they can be more of a pain to find a decent enclosure and a performant compatible SSD. For example, if you just look up a USB 4 or Thunderbolt enclosure on Amazon, you'll come across dozens of these. I personally use this Acasis one for about a year and a half now with no issues at all. It seems to disperse heat decently enough, granted it does get pretty warm. There are some other brands that are essentially the exact same product as well, and the important thing with these enclosures isn't necessarily the brand, but what's on the inside that counts. This Acasis and frankly most decent Thunderbolt enclosures are going to run a specific chipset the Intel JHL7440, and that should be marked somewhere on the product listing on most of these. This provides very solid speeds with specific drives. I did a bunch of research initially, and what I found was the Western Digital Black SN770 was the best value that I could find for performance and price. It clocks in at 3,129 megabytes per second read times and 2,761 write, which is on the higher side for these enclosures. The Samsung 980 Pro, which is the recommended drive for these enclosures, provides very similar speeds at 3,093 read and 2915 right, but the 980 Pros can sometimes be a little more pricey. For the sake of comparison, the base 512 gig drive in my Mac Studio runs at 3353 read and 2825 write speeds, so you're essentially getting the same performance, or in the case of the base 15 inch MacBook Air, much higher at 1719 read and 1400 write, so that makes these types of drives perfect for almost anything, whether that be video editing, gaming, you name it. Honestly, I can't tell the difference most of the time between this enclosure and any of the internal Mac drives, including the higher speed internal ones in the Pro Max that run at twice the speed. The nice thing is once you buy the enclosure, you can just buy these internal drives and swap them out whenever you want. And in the long term, I think that's much more affordable. I've never had any issues with that enclosure. I've been using it daily going on about a year and a half now, but there are a couple of new ones that have literally just come out that I'm super excited about, one being this Zyk Drive USB 4 enclosure. This uses an entirely new chipset running what I believe is an AS Media ASM 2464PD. They can be pretty hard to find right now, and I do think there are a few other brands that use this same chip as well, but using the Zyk Drive, I get about 10 to 12% better performance over the Acasis one. Not only does this perform better than the Acasis enclosure, but I also like the design more as well. It's got this big pad for dispersing heat, which it transfers to the outside of the case really well, and I haven't had any problems with this enclosure either. I need to include one more enclosure in here that I'd initially planned to include in this video, but it had chipped and I didn't know when or if it was going to arrive, and it just so happened that it showed up on the last day that I was filming. And that is this HyperNext drive. You may have seen this in the list as having the same chipset as the Zyke drive, and I've tested everything out, the thermals and the performance is pretty much identical, so the difference between these two is going to be with the design. The form factor and general look is quite different. On the Zyke drive, you've got a built-in USB cable, which is kind of neat. That's not on the next drive, but the cable is much longer there. And I'd say if you're choosing between these two, it's generally gonna come down to preference, but they are both fantastic. Now, before we ride off into the sunset, storing all of our favorite cat videos with ease, there's a couple more important things that we need to talk about to get these enclosures with internal drives properly set up. And that also affects these cheaper portable drives as well. The first thing that you're gonna notice when you buy one of these enclosures and put an internal drive into them and plug them into your Mac, is this message is gonna pop up saying that the disk isn't readable, which is perfectly normal. Our drive isn't formatted yet, so we can go ahead and do that by clicking this initialize button 
Or if you don't see this at all, you can hit command and spacebar to open up spotlight search and just type in disk utility and go into that. You can see our drive is in here and to format that, I'm just gonna hit this erase button, which will open up this new window that will let me format the disk. And the most important thing that we're gonna look at here is this format dropdown. We've got three main options here, APFS, macOS Extended, and XFAT. And depending on how you plan on using these drives, you're likely gonna consider two of these options, APFS and XFAT. XFAT is gonna be the most compatible option if you're using your drive between a Mac and a Windows machine, where in most cases you can transfer files seamlessly between operating systems, which is also what your little portable drives usually come formatted with. If you need that cross-platform functionality, you're kinda of stuck with XFAT, but I would highly recommend not using it if possible. The problem with XFAT is, unlike both macOS extended and APFS options, XFAT is not journal which basically just means it's a lot more inefficient and in the event of a system crash or power failure, a journaled file system is gonna be much safer for your data and less prone to corruption. XFAT also has a lot of issues working between Windows and Macs a lot of the time, and in general, if you're using an SSD with an iPad or an iPhone along with your Mac, the performance is terrible compared to APFS. APFS stands for Apple File System, and while it won't work with Windows, it is journaled and much more efficient, performant, and safer than XFAT, which is why I almost always format any drive that I have to APFS. Other options in here I wouldn't really worry about. macOS Extended, it's just an older file system that you'd likely use with a spinning hard drive, but I think APFS actually works fine with those now as well. And in regards to the scheme, I usually just leave this on GUID partition map. Once that's done, you just have to give it a name and you're all done, and you should see your drive in the finder window. You can do that same process for your portable drives, just find them in the disk utility and erase them. Just make sure that you don't have anything that you need on those drives. And if you're having any trouble not seeing your drive here, just make sure that your view is set to all devices. Finally, the last thing that I wanna mention is just in relation to overall drive health and performance. If possible, it's recommended to keep at least 10 to 20% of your drive storage free because it can increase the overall longevity and performance of your drive versus if you just have it filled up to the brim with stuff. If you've been around on the channel for a while, you'll know that I personally use Clean My Mac to manage my storage and clear out any junk that I have kicking around from old app installs and monitor my system. I'll have a link to that in the description along with all the physical products, but taking all that into consideration, I think that should give you a decent foundation for adding onto your storage with your Mac and giving you some value there. If you have any combinations of external drives or enclosures that you like, or if you're also using anything that I've mentioned here, drop a comment down below and let me know how those things are working for you. I hope this was informative and useful to a lot of you. If it was, feel free to hit that like button. If you want to see more tech related content or help organize a formal debate to determine if unicorns or dragons are better, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next upload.